P20 2021. And today we have the great privilege to welcome uh, Professor John Page, who is a distinguished professor at the University of uh, Manitoba in Canada. And Professor John Page is, is going to discuss about acoustic bubble metamaterials. Professor. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and also the wonderful series that you guys have created. I think this is a, one of the few really positive outcomes of having COVID these days. So, uh, thank you. So, as, as you said, what I uh, plan to do this morning here and this afternoon where you are uh, is talk about acoustic metamaterials constructed from bubbles. Uh, in, in a fluid or a soft solid. Uh, and this is a collaborative project. It's been going on for some years uh, with many researchers in France, particularly uh, at the Institut Langevin in Paris and also the Laboratoire MSC at the Université de Paris. Um, so, uh, the main focus of what I'm going to talk about then is going to be in, in two parts. I'm going to start off with uh, two dimensional bubble metamaterials, bubble screens or uh, metal layers, and focus on their properties for achieving nearly perfect broadband absorption for waterborne acoustic waves. And then in the second part, I'll turn to crystalline metamaterials made of bubbles and examine negative refraction focusing and imaging um, effects. So if we start off with looking at the reviewing quickly the history of superabsorbing uh, metastructures, most of the work uh, for very good practical reasons is focused on airborne sound. And there've been many clever designs, including uh, Ping Sheng's button uh, membrane structures, uh, the fabri perot channels, which have spectacularly broadband performance, um, sub-wavelength multi-resonant scatterers, spiral metamaterials and porous laminal materials and lots of other examples. But rather less attention has been paid to uh, metasurfaces for absorbing waterborne acoustic waves, even though that's probably the oldest example of uh, metamaterial in this context, uh, dates from alberic anechoic tiles, um, which were introduced initially during World War II to try to hide uh, submarines. Um, and there, there's also been some quite recent work um, with effective medium theory uh, examining um, a, a layered uh, acoustic metasurface. But what I'm going to talk about is what we call bubble metascreens, which is a two-dimensional layer uh, of, of bubbles in a soft matrix. So why do we like bubble metamaterials? Well, we usually need to invoke low frequency resonances uh, so we can define, effect, define effective properties. And bubbles are very, uh, very nice because they have strong monopolar resonances. Um, and here's an example of a nice simulation from uh, Bonchemin Dole. The uh, and one of the advantages for studying waterborne acoustic waves is the bubbles are strongly coupled to them. So that uh, facilitates interesting uh, progress and, and effects. So <clears throat> I'm going to start by looking at to what extent we can look at, we can achieve so called super absorption with these bubble meta screens. And then in the second part, I'll move on to uh, 3D metamaterial structures composed of bubbles. So let's start from the beginning. The, start, the beginning is familiar to everyone. It's the resonance of a, a single bubble. This goes back to work uh, of Minart 
um, in the 20s, the 1920s, I believe. And one can model the resonant behavior of a bubble as a mass spring system with a stiffness that's uh, induced by the compressibility of the gas and a mass that involves the inertia of the liquid um, or soft solid medium surrounding the bubble. And there's a well-defined resonant frequency, the, the Menard frequency, which is inversely proportional to the radius of the bubbles and depends on the acoustic pressure. And if there's a soft uh, matrix around it on the shear modulus of the matrix. So uh, this has been studied and uh, for a long time, uh, if the incident pressure wave is incident on the bubble, there's a scattered spherical pressure wave with a scattered function, which is a typical Lorentzian form uh, involving the minute frequency and losses, delta. Uh, and there's three main contributions to the damping that are well understood because of work by Andreas Prosoretti. Uh, there are radiative losses, of course, and there's also thermal and viscous losses. <clears throat> so what happens if we take these bubbles and put them in a single layer and illuminate them with a plane wave. Uh, this gives us a 2D bubble metascreen. Um, and because of the layered structure, they're all equally spaced, or they don't have to be equally spaced, but close to. Uh, they, the, all the bubbles oscillate in phase because there's many bubbles within a single trend, you know, wavelength. Um, this results in uh, resonant frequency being shifted and increase in the uh, radiative damping. And we've heard uh, Valentin Le Roy first worked out um, an analytic model to describe this kind of system. Um, and if one summarizes the results, the reflection, the amplitude reflection from the screen uh, now uh, depends on a resonant frequency, omega, which is shifted. Um, given approximately by this uh, result, which depends on the radius of the bubble and the separation between them. And the uh, radiative damping term is also enhanced. It would be the wave vector times A, you know, uh, simple uh, non-correlated, if you like, uh, layer of bubbles. But now it's increased because all the bubbles, are, a whole lot of bubbles are oscillating in phase and it's increased by amount, which depends on the number of bubbles within a square wavelength um, that are, whose motions are uh, illuminated um, coherently. Um, so we have super radiative damping, it's enhanced. And then we have the traditional dissipative damping terms. So this leads then to a transmission and reflection coefficient and from which one can calculate uh, the uh, absorption, the absorbance uh, by subtracting T and R from one. And we get this simple analytic form from this model. So what does that mean? What's the best you can do with a single bubble layer in terms of absorption? So the maximum of A will occur when omega equals zero, when you're on the resonance of this collective excitation of bubbles. Um, and when the dissipative damping is equal to the radiative damping. And this will occur if the matrix around the bubbles has an optimal viscosity, which is related to the dimensions of the system, the size of the bubble and the separation between them. Z here is the acoustic impedance. So the, this maximum corresponds to the critical coupling condition and gives a maximum absorbance of 0.5. For something like PDMS, which we used in our experiments, uh, we know the viscosity and the frequency range of study, and then we can uh, determine from this uh, simple expression here uh, an optimum set of parameters for A and for D. Uh, 
Uh, one can then tune uh, the absorbance by varying D, and we studied that through the model and through uh, COMSOL simulations, fine element simulations, and the model is, is, you know, agrees quite well with the simulations. Um, and that is encouraging. So one can note, of course, that if you have D that's too small, you get almost perfect reflection in D that's too big, separation that's too big. Between the bubbles, you get nearly perfect transmission. So there's a nice window in between. This type of system can be fabricated for experiments using soft lithographic techniques. Uh, which you create a mold, pour in PDMS, uh, pull the cured PDMS off the mold, turn it upside down, and put a layer over the top. Um, so, if we want to though do better than fifty percent, what can what can we do? There's two solutions: we need to break the symmetry, and the one way of doing that is to place the bubble meta screen on a good reflector, and that's probably, from a practical point of view, the most interesting. So if you um, attach this metal layer on a steel background, steel uh, backing layer, if you like, that would normally give you very high reflection, uh, what can we do to reduce the reflection and increase the absorption? Well, in the ideal case of a perfect reflector, there's a simple condition for zero reflection, uh, which you can get from this expression some of those two things gives you this um, and uh, one finds that the critical coupling condition is now slightly modified you need a different viscosity which is twice the original one um, so we can change a and d and we did that and uh, the experiments and the analytic model show pretty good agreement and pretty high absorption over uh, a fairly broad frequency range. So we were very encouraged by that. You'll notice that there are some wiggles in the absorption versus frequency curve. And that is due to the fact that the impedance of PDMS on itself is not an impedance match to water. So the next step was to improve on this. So we want to uh, match the impedance of the PDMS to water. And there's a simple way of doing that, which involves adding uh, a heavy powder. Uh, white paint works very well. Uh, and one can figure out the right proportion to add by simply uh, using effective medium theories, such as the coherent potential approximation or waterman truel theory. So when one does that, uh, one can get indeed very good impedance matching that matches the impedance of water. The effect of adding the white paint um, is, powder is to uh, increase the shear moduli, both the real and imaginary parts. The viscosity increases, that turns out to be a good thing. And the longitudinal attenuation also increases. So uh, we can do simple model predictions for an optimized configuration of radius and, and separation and get a uh, very broadband response, very high absorption over a uh, wide frequency range. That's the red curve here. So notice the wiggles with frequency have gone away. So this uh, impedance matching actually works. And the larger matrix viscosity also helps to increase the absorption bandwidth. There's another solution, and that is to create a so-called uh, coherent perfect absorber, initially conceived of uh, in optics as an anti-laser. Um, and the experiment is simple in principle. You have your uh, metal layer, and you irradiate the metal layer coherently from both sides with counter-propagating pulses. Um, 
So what do we find with our model and finite element simulations when we look at this system uh, with a viscosity in the right range and adjust the A and the D parameters appropriately? Um, the uh, red curve and the dashed red curve give our theoretical and uh, simulation predictions for the structure, and one can see one does indeed get perfect absorption over uh, a reasonably large range of frequency. And so, in this particular example, we had 99% absorption from, for a fairly wide frequency range from 2.4 to 5.9 megahertz. Um, what do we find experimentally? Uh, well, this is the experimental configuration. And one can adjust the phase between the two incident pulses from opposite sides by adjusting the separation of D2 relative to D1. And so one can uh, find the ideal phase condition for absorption or not. Um, and we can then... Uh, match the amplitudes emitted from transducer one and transducer two. And what one finds when the two pulses arrive in phase, as one might expect, is that uh, the signal detected in either transducer is very small. Whereas uh, when they're out of phase, you get a peak result, peak uh, pressure detected. So the optimization is almost perfect, but not really perfect, um, but still a large amount of the acoustic energy is absorbed in the meta screen. Uh, we repeated the experiments with a, a narrow band pulse and the cancellation is not quite as good, but it's not bad at all. Um, and that gives us a way experimentally of, of investigating the absorption over a wide frequency range. So uh, we were able to uh, repeat the narrow band uh, experiments, or repeat the analysis of the narrow band experiments, um, and extract the uh, coherent but uh, perfect absorber absorption and compare uh, with our theory and simulations. And the agreement is not bad. And despite the imperfect uh, optimization in this particular experimental case, uh, the absorption is certainly large and broadband. So what should one do if one wants to further optimize the bandwidth? Um, well, uh, the key features to look at, first of all, is the starting point really is that the bubble layer resonance has a low Q. And the second point um, is that the critical coupling condition itself is intrinsically broadband because the optimal viscosity does not depend explicitly on the frequency. If we want to optimize the um, broadband characteristics and the absorption for the uh, super absorber configuration with a bubble metamaterial stuck to a, a good reflector, we need a very good rigid reflector. Steel is good, one can do a little bit better if one has a tungsten substrate. So we do looked at the results from our model predictions uh, in that particular case to see what the ultimate uh, possibilities were. <clears throat> now to get broadband performance, you also want this combination of Ka and the dissipative damping to be large. So large super radiative uh, damping requires a small D. We need a concentrated uh, bubble metal layer. Uh, 
And we also need then correspondingly a large dissipation. So there's a large optimal viscosity. So as we can see for a given um, bubble size um, and matrix properties, if we can change the matrix by increasing the viscosity, the uh, broadband character um, is much uh, enhanced. When can examine the relative bandwidth um, as Ping has done in some of his uh, broadband uh, metamaterials uh, by looking at the relative bandwidth, which is defined by the difference in the upper and lower frequencies for the, cri the threshold criterion one chooses to examine um, divided by the average of F1 and F2. So, uh, as is sometimes done, if one, uh, well, just again, first of all, to illustrate that uh, uh, we want uh, a large dissipative uh, damping and proper optimization, and we get good results. Um, for a wide range of bubble sizes if one does the optimization properly. So what about this relative bandwidth? How does it depend on matrix viscosity? If we have a threshold of 0.9, uh, really large relative bandwidths are quite readily achievable. If one has larger bubbles and a lower frequency response of the system, one does need though um, a larger viscosity. If one ex then examines the critical coupling condition, one sees that the optimal viscosity uh, gives us a dependence on area volume fraction, which is exact, which is uh, reproduced in the uh, calculations. So the relative bandwidth increases with the bubble area fraction as one would expect, and it's approximately linear. If one sets a lower, a higher threshold of 99% of the uh, energy absor being absorbed, uh, of course the relative bandwidth is less, but it's still impressively large. Um, and we see the same kinds of dependence on the bubble area frac uh, fraction. Um, now, there's a limit to our analytic model. Um, it loses accuracy when the separation between the bubbles is less than about five radii. And that's because the, when the bubbles are too close together, they don't oscillate uh, spherically anymore. So one can extend the range that one might, exam might want to examine the viscosities and concentrations by uh, using comsulfide element simulations. And here are some results uh, which show that this can, uh, increase in viscosity, uh, increase in bandwidth uh, with viscosity keeps on growing at least over this range of viscosities. Um, and one might uh, be able to further increase the concentration we have not done such a good job of the optimization in ComSol for that situation, so I don't have any results to report here. But one might approach the absolute maximum relative bandwidth, which is 200%, uh, as one can see by examining the expression uh, for the relative bandwidth. So the point is, if one really puts one's mind to it, one can uh, find very large relative bandwidths with this kind of ultra thin bubble metascreen. Um, now the idea has been investigated and continues to be investigated in uh, the an application to Alberic tiles 
the advantage that we were able to bring to this problem is that our analytic model um, enables a better optimization of parameters than in many of the uh, simulations that have been done previously. And one can indeed achieve um, broadband reflection reflectance, which is the object. Nonetheless, one has to be careful with applying this to submarines because at, at deep depth, the uh, structure has not to collapse and that can be an issue. So people are still working um, on improving on this idea. There's also a potential application in the ultrasonic frequency range. Multi-wave imaging is uh, certainly very popular these days and, and a group at our university is looking at doing combined ultrasonic and microwave tomography data. And there's an issue with doing all this in the same cavity that the walls are highly reflecting. And so there are, uh, you do want to reduce reflections from the walls of the cavity for the ultrasound uh, tomography. So this uh, coating the inside with a suitable uh, bubble meta screen might indeed improve um, the possibilities. So the main message here is that we can achieve very broadband absorption of water bond acoustic waves using bubble meta screens. Now let's turn to three dimensional materials made of bubbles and look at negative refraction focusing and imaging. And we'll look at two cases, one where the uh, we have pairs of bubbles that are randomly dispersed, and then another case where they're arranged in a, period, in a periodic lattice. So the idea here is familiar to I think everybody, that if we want to uh, create uh, a three-dimensional acoustic metamaterial, which is doubly negative, um, a left-handed material, if you like, one needs overlapping monopolar and dipolar resonances um, at low frequencies. So that means combining either a single or two kinds of resonators, which have both a monopolar response and a dipolar response. And uh, Lee and Chen's uh, predictions uh, for soft rubber inclusions uh, were uh, followed up on experimentally by Thomas Brunet's group at Bordeaux, who did some very uh, powerful experiments. Uh, we looked at a, an alternative, hoping to reduce the dissipation of creating bubbly drops in a weak gel. The bubbles are tiny, one's in the effective medium regime, um, low frequency effective medium regime for the droplets, where the dissipation is relatively small the, from the bubbles themselves. And like the compressibility and, and uh, uh, dynamic mass density, uh, one uh, finds a trans one can predict a transmission which has a sharp dip, first of all, at the monopolar resonance and then a peak at the doubly at the uh, dipolar resonance because it overlaps in the frequency range of the monopolar wideband resonance. And indeed, in this situation, one gets a negative phase uh, for the transmission. Um, Okay, by, that's by way of introduction. If we just start with a monopolar resonance, as is characteristic of bubbles in a fluid-like matrix, um, can we expect to see double negative material uh, behavior? And the answer, of course, is no, unless we do something special, and what we need are strong spatial correlations. So if we have pairs of bubbles, by bubbles, if you like. Uh, this introduces a spatial correlation. And if one studies this, which we have done using multiple scattering theory, 
following the uh, LAX model from the 50s and with improvements more recently by Maxime Lenoir at, and colleagues at the Institut Langevin. Uh, this lets us look at larger systems of bubbles. Uh, what one finds if the uh, bubbles are simply randomly arranged, not surprisingly, there's a large band gap. But if we pair the bubbles with a fixed separation between them, there's a transparency window that opens up in the original bandwidth of the randomly dispersed uh, bubbles. So one can model this analytically by calculating the effect of scattering function with a pair of bubbles. Um, and if one focuses on the backward and forward scattering uh, uh, contribution, one can obtain the effect of compressibility using the waterman truel model. And one can see from the model that there's a monopolar response of the pairs at a frequency omega-1 and a somewhat higher frequency, uh, there's a dipolar response. Look at both uh, simulations and model predictions for this uh, system. One sees that there is a range of frequencies where there is a negative index for the pair bubble, the, the pair correlated bubbles. But uh, for the randomly dispersed bubbles, there is simply a large gap. Um, and one can see indeed uh, in this region where the index is negative, there's a peak in the transmission because the imaginary part of K um, is, uh, it, it oscillates, but there is a, a minimum. Um, so in the paracorrelated case, there is indeed, um, we can relate this situation to the compressibility and the dynamic mass density. And one finds indeed that there is an overlap between these resonances at omega one and omega two. Um, and here, the material is doubly negative. One can examine the concentration of uh, bubbles that are needed to uh, achieve this double negative uh, condition, and the concentration is really quite low. So if we're in this regime where the material is doubly negative, if the bubbles are paired, and not if the bubbles are not paired, but randomly dispersed, one can compare after much ensemble averaging, the uh, transmission through the uh, the uh, bubbly material uh, of an incident uh, plane wave or Gaussian beam. Um, and in the random case, when there's normal refraction, um, and that's also true in the paracorrelated case at the frequency omega one, but in the near omega two, there's almost no transmission for the random case. But for the pair correlated case, first of all, we see that the beam is refracted negatively, and then uh, it emerges on the far side. So, um, if now those results were obtained when the pairs of, of bubbles were aligned in one direction. One can go beyond and randomly uh, orient the directions of the pairs. Uh, 
and one can extend the uh, model to deal with that. It's not, it's all analytic, you can write it down. One has to integrate over all angles of the pairs relative to the incident direction. Um, and uh, the result works quite well, but we need a higher concentration of bubbles to see the effect. We can also examine the dynamic mass density as a function of, of bubble concentration and identify the uh, concentration needed. Um, we can also investigate the effect of losses uh, because we know that bubbles are lossy and, and so we can take, examine the contributions of losses typical of bubbles in a, 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 in a yield stress fluid. So the criterion for double negativity is modified. Um, and uh, at the original concentration volume fraction of 1%, the double negativity is suppressed by these losses. But all one has to do is to increase the bubble concentration and it reappears. Um, so double negative, doubly negative behavior still persists, but as has also been shown by others, uh, and uh, including Thomas Brunet's group, the fact that there is dissipation actually uh, facilitates the observation of a negative index. And so the criterion for a negative index is uh, easier to achieve. So you need a, fewer, a lower concentration to achieve that. Okay, so that's what one can do with just pairs of bubbles um, that don't even need to be uh, aligned pairs. Uh, in, a, in, in a fluid or a soft matrix. So that sort of identifies, if you like, the crucial element for getting out of monopolar resonators like bubbles, doubly negative behavior. So the next question is, what happens if we look at the case of crystalline metamaterials uh, with bubbles? Now in crystalline, uh, materials, the first negative refraction experiments were actually done with phononic crystals, not in the metamaterial range. Uh, they go back quite a long time to some of the first experiments in our group. And uh, one point perhaps to note is that, um, that we started with a 3D system. We also looked at 2D. And that we were able to observe super resolution focusing in the 2D phenonic crystal of steel rods in water uh, with a resolution that is better than the re traditional Rayleigh limit. There have been many, many studies in phenonic crystals, uh, and uh, I didn't have time to list them all here, uh, but I did review some of the, uh, the work up to 2016 uh, in this article, where you can find many of the references. Now, in the crystalline metamaterial case, as far as I know, the first negative refraction experiments were performed in 2D uh, by the group of Fabrice Lemoult and Geoffroy Lerouzi. Uh, using soda cans arranged um, in a graphene lattice, a honeycomb lattice. And they got some quite spectacularly narrow local spots um, and demonstrated uh, super resolution imaging. But in acoustics, I don't think there have been uh, cases of three dimensional bubble metamaterials. Three-dimensional materials 
metamaterials in which these effects have been really shown and investigated. So uh, what's a good structure to do? Well, we should start off with an isotropic structure. So we should start off with an FCC lattice. That's the lattice that we used in our first phononic crystal experiments to investigate band gaps. Uh, and, and also uh, focusing. Um, but things get better if we go to the diamond structure in which the primitive unit cell now contains two bubbles at a fixed separation, of course. So one might anticipate from one solid state physics that this type of diatomic lattice might be very interesting because there will be optic as well as acoustic phonon bands at low frequencies. So here's the band structure, comparing the band structure for the case of the FCC um, crystal structure of bubbles with the diamond structure. Parameters used um, are, are here. The res these results again come from our multiple scattering model um, as developed by Maxime uh, Lenoir uh, in collaboration with the group at uh, the Institut Notion. Um, and the notable feature is that if one looks near the top of the first propagation band, which is zoomed in at the box on the top, for the FCC structure, there is simply a band gap, whereas there is a negative band in the case of the diamond structure. And as this negative band, uh, which is of potential interest for looking at negative refraction effects. Uh, I guess I should highlight that, that also this is resonance based. The resonance of a single bubble is just below the top of the band gap for the FCC structure. Um, so it's a resonant based effect. The, Band gap occurs because of hybridization and resonance effects. Um, and this uh, negative band is really a metamaterial effect and not just a uh, Bragg scattering effect, uh, as in the phononic crystal case. Now, one of the key advantages of the diamond structure is that this negative band is actually very isotropic, we superpose the dispersion relation for different directions, uh, different principal directions in, 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 in the crystal structure. They match extremely well over most of the Brion zone, so most of the range of frequencies for which this band exists. So one would indeed expect that one can reach the uh, condition where the relative, the refractive index is negative and equal to minus one. Um, and so would, what would one, exp what would one see if one has a Gaussian beam incident on a slab, a flat slab, uh, uh metamaterial, uh, containing these bubbles. So as one would expect, uh, an incident beam, a lot of it may be reflected. Some of it is refra refracted, but negatively across the crystal and emerges with a displaced beam on the far side. The uh, propagation inside can be perhaps better seen if we look at the pressure rather than the relative energy. So indeed, uh, negative refraction occurs. Uh, what about focusing by negative refraction? Well, at n equals minus one, indeed one observes a nice image on the opposite side of the lens, provided the source is close to the, the lens surface, so that evanescent waves from the source can be captured effectively. 
Um, but the if one looks at the uh, profile, transverse profile of the image here uh, as a function of distance divided by the uh, wavelength in the water outside, one can see that uh, this image is not super resolved. It's close, but it's not. The dashed gray curve is the prediction um, that you would get out of a sync function and obeying the Rayleigh criterion. Um, so we're close, but it's not uh, super uh, resolved. We can play with the frequency though, if one decreases the frequency slightly, so that the uh, index becomes more negative, one can indeed see a very nice image still, it's moved closer to the lens surface, but it's still distinct from the lens surface. And if one looks at the transverse profile in this case, the gray curve is the Rayleigh criterion result. The uh, red dashed curve is a fit of a sync function to the uh, results that we get from our calculations. Um, and one can see that it's narrower. So we have a focal spot that is a bit narrower, and therefore we've entered the super resolution regime. If one decreases the frequency even more, the spot moves closer to the surface, and one indeed uh, observes uh, a finer uh, super resolved focal spot. Okay, so negative refraction works. Negative refraction focusing works in this 3D acoustic metamaterial. What about actually imaging an extended object? Um, so we've got an example here where a source uh, uh, indicating the letters 3 and D is created out of 92 point sources and is inclined with respect to the lens itself so that one can see real 3D imaging effects even though the source is two-dimensional as planar. And so the source that is uh, imaged through uh, the crystal indeed faithfully reproduces the three and the D, so it respects the shape and the size and the orientation of the original object. And if we take slices through the uh, energy profiles, um, one can indeed follow the depth of field information um, on the source side. Of course, that's what we have, and on the image side. So we think these results nicely demonstrate the potential of this three-dimensional diamond bubble meta lens for 3D uh, imaging in this negative regime. Now, our simulations that we've done so far uh, for the 3D bubble metamaterial do not account for damping. So they are uh, illustrate the potential, but not the full story. But we know what's going to be possible from our bubble pairs results, the bi-bubbles. We expect that all one needs to do is to increase the concentration. Remember that the volume fraction is extremely low in these simulations in order to, uh, for, for computational reasons that limit the number of scatterers that we can account for. So we haven't been able to examine that re this regime with dissipation yet because uh, of the limited 
computational resources uh, available to us. It's still pretty good. Um, what about practical experiments that can look at these predictions? If one tries to create a 3D ordered bubble array by trapping bubbles in the yield stress fluid, this turns out to be extremely challenging in positioning. When you add bubbles, you disturb the positions of the ones that are there already, uh, and disorder is introduced. However, there is a very promising solution to this problem that has been proposed by Philippe Marantin's group, and that is to use uh, 3D printed frames to stabilize and control the bubbles, which in this case are cubic. So the uh, 3D frame is created. The dimensions in this case were of order a millimeter. Um, and simply by treating the surfaces, when this is slowly immersed in water, there's an interface between the water and the air trapped inside. And this interface takes on a curved uh, surface that is quite similar to an ordinary bubble that's not stabilized by this frame. So this appears to be a very realistic uh, experimental approach for investigating predictions such as the ones that we have made. So to, con to con conclude, to wrap up, uh, bubbles uh, in a yield stress fluid or a soft solid, or even in water, are ideal building blocks for creating acoustic metamaterials. Um, I looked at the options for looking at super absorbing bu bubble meta screens. And the study of this problem is facilitated by a simple analytic model that's very useful for design and optimization. We validated the model. Uh, by experiments and simulations. For both types of configurations, the super absorbing one where the meta screen is placed on a highly reflecting surface, um, transforming a high reflectivity material into a very low one, and the coherent uh, perfect absorber configuration. Someone can achieve perfect absorption in the case of the coherent perfect absorber, uh, as its name suggests. Um, but for the uh, SAB configuration, the absorption can't be quite perfect because there's always some small leakage into the hard rigid reflector on the backing. Uh, and for water and acoustics, that reflector cannot be, that reflection coefficient cannot be exactly one. Nonetheless, very significant broadband uh, absorption can be achieved. In the second part, I talked about doubly negative bubble metamaterials. Um, creating doubly negative materials through pairwise spatial correlations of these low frequency monopolar resonances of the bubbles. So the so perhaps initially surprising result is that we can create these doubly negative bubble metamaterials starting from a system which has only monopolar isolated resonances. We get double negative behavior in both random and ordered configurations of the bubble pairs and super resolution focusing is possible. And that I think is all I have to say. So I'm happy to discuss any questions that we may have. Thank you so much, Professor Page. So we welcome uh, questions from the audience. Uh, this can be, you know, general questions or very focused. So please come forward with your questions, people.